everybody, and welcome to Georgia Traveler. I'm your tour guide, Gerald Bryant. We're on St. Simons Island because this week we're visiting Georgia's beautiful southern coast. Here's a look at what's on this week's program. You'll see some of the mysterious spirits that watch over St. Simons Island. We also spend an evening at the Jekyll Island Club Hotel, located in Jekyll's beautiful historic district. You'll see a couple of forts that echo Georgia's beginnings. And we invade Brunswick, Georgia's annual Stubalee. All those stories are coming up, but first we want to share some of the breathtaking sights you'll see when you visit Georgia's coast. Our first stop is Brunswick, gateway to the Golden Isles, just five miles west of St. Simons. Brunswick, Georgia, normally a laid back coastal community, but not today. This town is in a stew, Brunswick stew that is. It's been more than a quarter of a century since Team Virginia took home the coveted Brunswick Cup, symbol of stew supremacy. But can they go all the way this year? Let's go to Phil Proctor. Thanks, G. Cosell. You know, when you think about great rivalries in football, there's the Chiefs and the Raiders, the Skins and the Cowboys. Well, you know what? It's no different. Here at the Mary Ross Park, down here in Brunswick, Georgia, we've got Stew Wars. That's right. It's a battle of the Brunswick Stew. Brunswick County, Virginia versus Brunswick, Georgia. Who makes the better stew? It's a competition between stew masters. It's about the meat. It's the best stew. Stewly is uh, bragging rights for the next year. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Brunswick Rockin' Stubilee! The Stubilee festivities are officially kicked off with a 5K and a pooch parade. But at the stew grounds, the judges wasted no time getting down to serious business. We've got three categories of primary judging. We have an appearance category, taste, and texture. We tell them in the appearance that obviously it should look like Brunswick stew. The uh, texture category, the meat should be tender, shouldn't be something that's hard to chew. Uh, the vegetables should still have an integrity to them. They shouldn't be mushy. And, and of course the taste, uh, that becomes even more of a personal preference, I think. There are teams that are trying to be distinguishable. There are teams that are trying to make a good statement. So uh, there'll be a good variety of taste there. Among the many teams representing Georgia are the good folks from the Brunswick Station Cafe. I took the opportunity to talk to the co-owners of this downtown Brunswick fixture about their business and the business of stew. It seems to be the place to be in Brunswick. If you're looking for somebody for breakfast or lunch, you can just about find them in here. So most of our customer base is 80% of it is locals. And then we have a lot of nice tourists that walk by and stop in to get Brunswick stew. I headed to the kitchen to get the lowdown on the stew from the cafe's secret weapon, Jan Cox. Tell you how I prepare mine, except for the little secrets. Uh, but Brunswick stew is an oddity in the culinary world because so many different types of stew are called Brunswick stew. Some are soupy, some are stewy, some have vegetables in them like uh, corn, potatoes, tomatoes. Others have those same ingredients but they'll add lima bean, beans, peas, uh, okra. So there's really no one way to cook stew, but of course our way is the best. So everybody knows what all ingredients are in there. They just don't know the quantities that are in there or the secret spices. But the key is getting all the juices and spices and meats and, and veggies together. Once those flavors melt, that's when it becomes Brunswick stew. You would rather have your stew cook a day or two ahead of time and then take it over the day of the event. Absolutely. Right? Because there's some people that I've talked to, and I won't mention any names, Team Virginia, they say they like to do theirs the day of the event. Their stew, well, you know, it's Virginia. They really don't know the definition of stew. So we'll see. When the day is done and the people and judges vote, I think Virginia's going to be running with their tail stuff. But Team Virginia doesn't seem intimidated. 
they've been concentrating on their game plan. I'm stirring up a pot of stew with the Red Oak Stew Crew. And fellas, I appreciate y'all letting me stir the pot. Now, you told me there's a specific way I'm supposed to be doing this, right? Yeah. And David, you said I was unraveling some things. You unstirring everything we stirred up since 3 o'clock this morning. Uh, okay, so if I go sideways, does that help? That would help, yeah. That would okay, help. That would help, okay. Now, what is actually in this particular pot? Bada bam. Bada bam. <laughs> Thanks, David. Steve. I knew you and I had a great time of communicating. Let me be more specific then, David. What ingredients are in the pot? <laughs> Potatoes and onions, butter beans and corn. This crew works hard on their 85 gallons of stew because they've got a lot to prove. After all, there is this long-standing controversy about the origins of Brunswick stew. There isn't any controversy. It started here. I have heard it was not made in Virginia. Brunswick stew originated in Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, the state legislature has documented that by resolution. There are no living witnesses because it goes back to the 1700s, but we have people who will give you a sworn affidavit that it started here. Georgia claims the first pot of Brunswick stew was made here in this pot, but folks from Virginia's Brunswick County disagree. Regardless, Georgia stew masters aren't scared of the Virginia competition. And taste is what it's all about. My good friend Gerald Bryant couldn't resist the opportunity to pump up Team Georgia. I am an official taster now, so uh, Phil, you're not the only one getting to eat some of this Brunswick stew today. Oh, Team Virginia, watch out. You haven't got a chance. This is the way I like it. Well, we can see the There's meat. There's identifiable meat content. Yeah, I don't like that old messy stuff. This is, true that you, this is true that you can chew. That's the new uh, catchphrase around here. Once again, Virginia has no chance. Yes! While people vote for their favorites, behind closed doors, judges taste and tabulate the scores. Then comes the moment 51 stew teams have all been waiting for. First place in People's Choice this year with 361 votes, Blackwater Grill. <laughs> so if you didn't get any of theirs today, I bet you they'll sell you a bowl. First place judges award, 2005 Brunswick Stew Belief, First Bank of Brunswick. And it looks like a touchdown for Team Georgia. Don't take it so hard, Virginia. There's always next year. During your visit to Georgia's southern coast, you'll certainly want to stop at the St. Simon's Lighthouse. Originally built in 1810, it was destroyed by retreating Confederate troops near the beginning of the Civil War. They didn't want Union ships to be guided by its light. The current structure was built in 1872 and has been guiding ships ever since. All around the lighthouse, you'll see several live oak trees, and in those live oaks, you'll see faces, or spirits, that are watching from above. Um, about uh, 20 years ago, a sculptor came to St. Simons and asked the director of one of the art centers here for permission to carve the faces of some of the lost mariners that he saw hidden in the trees. The image was in there and it just kind of came out. The artist Keith Jennings is the one that had the idea to sculpt them. And he saw already imaginary faces in the trees before he ever started to carve them. And as he would start, I understand, he would begin to see, he would let the uh, oak tree tell him where to carve and so forth. And that's why they sort of change with age also, because as the tree gets older, so do the, some of the faces. There are four of them that are on public property on St. Simon's, and that's a, that's a must-see. Some are carved high on the knots of trees, some lower to the ground, others in crevices and harder to find. 
I think the tourists like them a lot. It's sort of a game. I understand from the Chamber of Commerce, people take a map and go around and try to find the faces that he's carved. And as Mildred Huey Wilcox states, there's a reason all these carvings are of male mariners. He liked to do men because men had more character when they aged and women didn't really, really like to see themselves <laughs> age. So I thought that was rather interesting. Aging with character, the tree spirits will continue watching over the people of St. Simons. So while you tour the island, be on the lookout for these majestic trees. Now, if the tree spirit is willing, it's time for us to move on down the road. To explore Georgia's colonial beginnings, it's off to Darien, just 23 miles north of St. Simons. It was a time of empires, colonies, and trade. The story of Georgia's settlement begins at Fort King George on Georgia's southern coast. It's really a time period in history that is oftentimes overlooked by a lot of historians and uh, a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people think that Georgia started in 1733 and kind of grew from there. But they don't realize that the antecedents toward the establishment of Georgia go all the way back to the establishment of Fort King George with the feud between the Spanish and the British over who had a right to the Omaha River. It's all the concept that Fort King George stood for. What makes it so significant is it's Georgia before Georgia. The true significance of the fort that we try and impart upon the public when they come here is that this was the first step in the process toward the establishment of Georgia. The state of Georgia acquired the land in 1950 and conserves this historic site. The Lower Altamaha Historical Society funded the reconstruction of the fort's blockhouse in the 1980s. The state has recently funded additional structures like the barracks and officers' quarters. To help visitors appreciate what life was like during this first period of history at Fort King George, historic site staff and volunteers host events like this candlelight tour of the fort. We light the whole entire fort up by candlelight, torches and lanterns and so forth, and people really like that. It's, it's very beautiful. It's one of the only events where we tell people when they come in, this is Fort King George, 1725, and these are the activities that you would have seen going on at the fort. We have a very talented lady who's very knowledgeable about women's domestic skills, who does our baking and brewing uh, demonstration. We have the colonial doctor, the colonial herbalist. We do all of our military weapons, the muskets and the artillery. And we actually stage a debate between a Spanish emissary and uh, the Colonel uh, John Barnwell, who was the Colonel here at the fort. In 1732, King George II of Great Britain granted a charter to James Oglethorpe to establish the colony of Georgia on the land between the Savannah and Altamaha rivers. After establishing the colony at Savannah in 1733, Oglethorpe moved south. One of his first military outposts to help establish Britain's claim was Fort King George. A lot of the same concepts, ideas, and vocabulary that General Oglethorpe used in justifying Georgia was used in establishing Fort King George. The idea of establishing a military buffer zone to uh, keep the Spanish out of uh, the southeast portions of, of North America and, and specifically away from the Altamaha River. General Oglethorpe brought 177 Scottish Highlanders here to establish the town of Darien. Working further southward establishing his British colony, Oglethorpe built a town and fort on St. Simon's Island that same year. It was called Frederica in honor of Frederick, Prince of Wales. He may have thought that was going to be his premier town in Georgia. And again, a, a colonial era fortification, first system, and uh, a relatively permanent large scale work, much more so than anything in Savannah. Fort Frederica is, I think, first and foremost, a story of, of struggle. Uh, struggle for the original settlers who came here, arriving from London. Um, imagine leaving London and arriving in coastal Georgia and dealing with a lot of the difficulties. Struggle to really get a foothold here. And I think the story of Frederica is also struggle between empires. So the struggle between Britain and Spain as to who ultimately was going to own this place. In 1739, open hostilities between the British and Spanish began in what was known as the War of Jenkins' Ear. When the Spanish attacked St. Simon's Island in 1742, troops stationed at nearby Fort King George came to assist at the Battle of Bloody Marsh. It's an, you know, an epic tale of a, uh, a regiment of, of, of Georgia, a ragtag regiment of, of Georgia uh, uh, militia 
and soldiers that uh, were severely outnumbered by the Spanish. They stood the ground on St. Simon's Island and some of the, according to the records, the, the bravest fighters uh, were the Scottish Highlanders that uh, really stood the line and, and fought in combat with the Spanish that day. General Oglethorpe is often rightly referred to as the father of Georgia. It's a place that with his influences, uh, some amazing things happened. As a military commander, in some ways he got very lucky. But really by being a leader of his men, training them, he did the one thing that the Spanish, in a sense, were trying to do is he made this place unnecessary because by defeating those Spanish, it became a place that the British government didn't have to have soldiers at. Uh, so from success came ultimate failure for Frederica. After the British regiment disbanded, many of Frederica's residents relocated. In 1758, much of what was left of the old town was destroyed by fire. The site lay dormant until 1936, when Congress created Fort Frederica National Monument. It opened to the public in 1945. Since that time, there's been a lot of effort in preservation of the historic resources here. There's uh, ruins and foundations that are preserved. Today we have thousands upon thousands of artifacts that tell their story, the story of daily life here. The main street in town was Broad Street, and we're very fortunate that as we started doing the archaeology starting in the late 40s, that uh, we found these buildings made of, of brick and tabby, these, these buildings that really show that these people meant to stay here for a long time. Those foundations, as we uncovered them, we left them open to give a better sense of the size of the town. It's a place that would be a, a field with a bunch of signs in it without uh, those ruins and the foundations. The place provides an opportunity to see a bit of our past. It's a place that helps us recognize that uh, the stories of colonial America are, are large, that they are in each of our backyards. Little places like this that preserve more than just ruins and foundations, but they preserve symbols of, of broken dreams of people who tried to do something amazing and did something pretty amazing, but also people who uh, weren't able to make it here in, in coastal Georgia. Just two miles by sea, but almost 20 miles by land, just south of St. Simons Island, you'll find Jekyll Island. And as David Zelsky explains, there's quite a rich history to this island. Carnegie, Pulitzer, Vanderbilt, Rockefeller. These men and a handful of others met in Jekyll Island, Georgia nearly 100 years ago, a think tank that represented at the time over 70% of the world's wealth. And from their meetings in Jekyll Island, the Federal Reserve was born. They called it the Millionaire's Club, a retreat where the richest families in the world could escape the everyday hustle and bustle of city life and relax along the southern shores. They were interested in having a hunting club hunting retreat uh, in a climate where they could come in their own private yachts, where they could further their political, financial goals with great ease. I contend that you could go in the dining room at night and if your plan happened to be building a railroad to the Mississippi, you could accomplish most of it right in that dining room at dinner. Over recent years, this destination has been restored and expanded, but the aura unchanged. The place, known today as the Jekyll Island Club Hotel, is without a doubt one of the most precious jewels in the Golden Isles. There are many ways to get around Jekyll Island. You can do it the more modern way, which I find a little more lazy going by car, or you can do it the way they did back in the 1880s, traveling by horse or even by Schwinn. Absolutely the best way to see Jekyll Island is by bicycle. There are 22 miles of wonderful flat bicycle paths and these take you through the maritime forest, the historic district, along the beach with the dunes and um, you can also see of course the Atlantic Ocean on one side of the island and on the close side of the island your eye can stretch almost to the other side of the county um, to see the marshes of Glen. You can come with your families and let your kids pretty much ride bikes and be on their own without worrying too much about them getting in any trouble or lost. Georgia lawmakers decided years ago to preserve these islands along Georgia's coast and that motto has remained. If you search some of the trails on Jekyll, you'll be surprised what you might find. Whether it's baby raccoons hanging out by the water's edge or a graveyard that tells a story dating back 100 plus years, 
Jekyll is quite unique. If people came here to visit, I would love for them to go home with a greater awareness of what a treasure this is, historically, architecturally, uh, naturally, and because of the hospitality. The preservation of this island is probably the most critical element, and we're trying to get it back to the way it was historically, which was predominantly to keep the traffic on the back and the periphery of the, of the district and everything on the view and the front side of the district to be more pedestrian related. Take an afternoon to stroll out on the pier and you may find a shrimp boat dropping off its latest fresh catch for visitors to enjoy at the famous Raw Bar. After enjoying some fresh shrimp and oysters, you may want to meet Bulldog Book out on the links. This is Jekyll Island Golf Club. We've got three 18 0 golf courses on the nine. We've got Oleander, Pine Lakes, and Indian Mounds. Now, I spent most of my time on Oleander. You all come back to see me. Things change on the island when night falls. You may hear stories of ghosts who reportedly walk the halls. Of course, ghosts are to be expected whenever you're down on the Georgia coast. There are certain places that I can walk about that um, give me something of a sense of presence. And um, I, I don't know if these are necessarily individuals, but they might be. We surmise that perhaps J.P. Morgan likes to come back to his favorite haunt and smoke that big black cigar on that porch from time to time. But night at the Jekyll Island Club Hotel also means fine cuisine. Delicious. Enjoy a meal at the courtyard at Crane, or maybe a five-course dinner in the grand dining room. Robert Redford took a particular liking to this room when directing The Legend of Bagger Vance. It was easily done because the atmosphere here was so immediately of another time, a slower pace, a more, a, a gentler time, if you will. So after the bike ride, the nature walk, shrimp at the raw bar, golfing with Bulldog Buck, a romantic stroll at sunset, and dining like millionaires of old, you may want to get a little shut-eye. So go right ahead. This island is staying just the way it is now for you to enjoy on your next visit, even if your name isn't Rockefeller. We conclude our visit to coastal Georgia at Christ Church here on St. Simons Island. Almost 150 years before the current church was built in the 1880s, John and Charles Wesley held services on the grounds here under these oak trees. It's just another site to add to your list of must-see attractions when you visit coastal Georgia. I hope you join us for the next Georgia Traveler. Until we meet again, I'm Gerald Bryant wishing you pleasant journeys. This is a GPB original production.